and it's finally finished. Ah, well, kind of. Hello, my name is Emily Crow from Crochet Creations and welcome to my YouTube channel where I love to talk about all things yarny and today is a yarn podcast episode 35 of the Crochet and Knitting podcast where I'm going to talk about all things that I've been working on that I finished and even some new yarn goodies and at the end of the episode I'll be talking about what's going on in my life things I've been enjoying including a lot of books recently so I hope you can stick around grab something to drink I've got my water stay hydrated it's still really hot right Right now and not quite feeling like fall but I know it's coming really soon so grab something to drink grab a product to work on and let's chat about all things yarn today is kind of a spur of the moment podcast I just recently finished editing my last podcast it's taken me a while I'm working a full-time job and I have a toddler just I cannot do things as fast as I used to in this season of life and so I just finished that last podcast I didn't think I would film today but I did my makeup for something else and I'm feeling cute and I have a few hours so I'm hoping I can knock out this podcast. I don't have things to share with you that I anticipated but I have some things I'm really excited to share with you today and so I wanted to just sit down and do this podcast. And so here we are. I really want to get back onto like a monthly type of schedule where I can film what I knit and crocheted within the month of September, for example. And so I need to kind of get my schedule a little bit shifted. So filming this a little bit earlier than I have been so that hopefully I can finish editing it before the end of the month and we can film a podcast at the very end of September or the very beginning of October to kind of reset on a monthly schedule. We shall see how that all works. Stay tuned if you want to know more and make sure to subscribe to my channel shameless plug. So let's talk about, I don't think we have any like news or anything exciting in that sense. So let's talk about my finished objects for today. Okay. The first finished object I want to share with you is my Athenaeum socks, which is actually a recently released pattern. I was able to test for Roran Cades or Kelly Menzies and look at this awesome texture. I love it. So I tested the size, is the size two? I can't remember. For my daughter, it's a 48 stitch count sock and I loved it so much. I love this yarn. I love this pattern. It was the perfect blend of vanilla plus knitting and I felt like all the details were really intentional so that this is a really easy sock to make. It's not super complicated, but like the heel flap is mirroring the texture up above. It's just really cool. Lots of really, really neat details that make this a really good pattern. So I wanted to use the rest of my yarn to make socks for me. And I finished both. I have a finished pair. I have not been able to get a picture of myself and my daughter both wearing our socks together. She just like was not in the mood. <laughs> so I got pictures of just our socks together, but they're really cute. I'm really excited to match my daughter. And this yarn is Alexandra, the art of yarn in the color Silverton, which was the local yarn store day colorway in 2019, I think, at Wasatch and Wool, which is up in Park City. It has moved since 2019. It was previously in another town near Park City area, but now it is in Park City itself. And so the skein was a little bit more than 100 grams. I can't remember if it was maybe 115 grams. And I only had about 10 grams left when all was said and done between my socks and my daughter's socks. I did my daughter's socks exactly to pattern, so they're as high as Kelly recommended. But then for my socks, I did one section of these columns and I did math to figure out approximately how much yarn I thought I would need for both pairs and then figured that I would only be able to do confidently two stripes before I could move on to the next part of the sock and still have enough yarn. And I did. I don't have the ball with me. It's like back there somewhere in one of my little jars or bins for little scraps, but I have like 10 grams left maybe not even that. So it was a good call because I felt confident that I could definitely finish both socks with the yarn I had. If I had done one more section, 
I would have cut it really, really close and I might have even been short and that would have been very, very painful. So I'm glad I didn't do that. And now I have maybe nine or 10 grams left of yarn that I can use for like some fun color work or toes and heels of a different sock or I'm not sure what, but it's just some really beautiful yarn. And so I didn't want to miss out on it. Tried to use as much as I could. It would have been even cuter, I think, if I could have made my daughter's socks match mine a little closer, like proportion wise. But I used the yarn that I had and I did not lose it yarn chicken. And I'm really excited for when we get to wear these together and match. It's just too dang hot to wear any like hand knit socks unless for bedtime. The past couple nights I've been able to wear my hand knit socks to bed to just keep my feet nice and cozy and yay, I love it. Do you wear your hand knit socks to bed? I know lots of people do not like wearing socks to bed, but do you wear your hand knit socks to bed to keep your toes warm? Let me know down below what you do. But I've always been a wear socks to bed kind of person, so it's not a stretch to wear my hand knit socks to bed. That's just me. So that's my first FO. And my next one, I'm really, really proud of this one actually. Oh, I love this. So this is my Desert Vista Dye Works pair of socks for August. And I mentioned last podcast that I was really hoping that I could find a pattern to do like cacti on the top of my sock near the cuff because I wanted to use a mini and do some color work. I just wanted to do something different because I was getting sick of just doing vanilla socks and I'd done a couple other textures and things. So wanted to do color work for my stripey socks, even though I haven't really done color work with stripey yarn before. So I thought it would be fun and different. And I managed to find the perfect pattern that was literally perfect, exactly what I was envisioning. So maybe I've seen these socks before, but maybe I haven't. But the pattern that I found was called the Comfy Cacti Socks by Bloom Create. I'm a Janet, I'm not sure. I basically did my own vanilla sock pattern and I copied the color work section from this pattern. I purchased the pattern and I did the color work portion and like a couple rows on either side of the color work to help transition the stitch counts. And so I followed that bit of the pattern only and I was able to incorporate this color work into my socks. I used Desert Vista Dye Works in the color Abstract Cacti. It just felt very August in Utah, even though my area is not a desert. This feels very deserty to me. I thought it was appropriate and I used a natural mini. I love it. Oh my goodness. So, so beautiful. And honestly, it worked out perfectly. Like the striping, it's kind of hard to tell. I think there's two different stripes of green color. One is a little bit more bluish in tint and a little lighter, a little less saturated. And this like bluish lighter one is a little bit bigger than the other green one from what I can see. But again, the colors are so close, they kind of blend together a little bit. But about one or two rounds after starting the green, I started doing the color work, follow the color work, and then for the last like one or two rounds of color work, it ended in the brown section. So it looks like the cacti are like in the ground. It's like, I could not have planned this. It is so, so good. And I was a little bit nervous until I thought about it a little bit more. I counted the rows. There's like 18 rows here. And so I expected there to be 18 rows of green elsewhere and I got nervous because in the other sections there's only like 14 rows and I'm like oh my gosh why did this one stripe end up so much longer it's because I did color work and so when you hold your floats behind your yarn that yarn is shorter than the yarn it would take to knit the same number of stitches if that makes sense and so my yarn was able to go farther because I was holding it in the floats Ta-da! So yeah, it worked out just perfectly. My other sock worked out just exactly the same. The hardest part was I didn't realize how long the green part of the striping was. And so I just started my skein where, where it was when I wound it up. And I didn't realize that this was not like one single color. It's like the end of one color and all the rest of the next green. I had to cast on a few times to like, 
make sure that my socks lined up perfectly and they worked out just fine. I'm really, really happy with them. They are a little bit tight to get on because of the color work. It's not quite as many stitches increased in the color work as I typically do. And I tried really hard to like spread them out and whatnot, but there's only so much you can do. I can still get them on my feet, so I think it'll be just fine. But I'm really, really proud of them. It's a really good pattern, and it includes like three colors in the color work. So you have like this cool, like sunsetty feature in the sky, which is really neat. But I only did two colors. I did the cacti themselves, and then I did background for all the rest. And I love it. Love, love, love. Probably my favorite FO of this month. I've actually got one more FO and maybe this one should be my favorite because it's taken me so, so long to do. I finally finished my husband's Viking cardigan. Ah, well, kind of finished. Let me explain, but let me model it first. Okay. Ta -da. This is my husband's Viking cardigan. This pattern is by Martin Story and it's a very, very warm sweater right now. So I should probably take it off, but I wanna show you guys what it looks like. So this pattern is by Martin Story. It's from an old issue of Row Magazine, like 2012, maybe issue like 52 maybe. Anyway, the pattern is not size inclusive because it was written in 2012. So that was not as much of a concept back then, unfortunately and it was really hard to track down the pattern. So I don't necessarily recommend it, but I know Martin Story has a lot of more like broad shoulder, typically masculine graded patterns if you're looking for something in that fit. So this is called Viking. It's got like patchworks of like stock in it and these cabled X's. So lots of fun texture. It's got a button band that I did and then a collar just ribbing and it's hot. Ooh. So the plan was to finish the sweater for my husband's birthday, which was at the very end of August. I was really, really close, but it was like four o'clock in the afternoon on his birthday. And I just finished attaching everything together. And I knew I would not finish. So he got his cardigan, but it's got like the finishing touches. It's all sewed together, all the knitting is done. So I'm gonna call it an FO. Yeah, I'm gonna do that because it's my podcast, my rules, but there are still tons of ends to weave in because it's knit in parts. So there are two front panels, a back panel, two sleeves, and then you also knit the two sides of the button band separately and attach them on. And then you also knit the collar separately and attach it on. So there's just a lot. So I've just been piecing away at these ends and working them out. And I actually am really happy with how this turned out. It fits my husband well. He likes the fit of it. All of the bigger pieces, so besides the button band and the collar, are already blocked. So it smells really nice. And it's not nearly cold enough to be able to wear this. It is a hot hot cardigan and so I have some time I want to find the right kind of buttons maybe I'll do like toggle buttons or something I don't know I gotta look for buttons and I gotta weave in all the ends but then it's all done and there's nothing more to do with it so I'm really happy with how it turned out it took me a long time I started it in December of last year so I'm really happy I could have it finished and hopefully I can have it wearable by the time the weather starts to get cold so this month in September sometime. I just need to whittle away at it a little bit at a time and do some shopping for some cool buttons. Yeah, that's the plan. I am so excited to be done with this. This has just been like kind of a big task on my brain to make sure I do this for my husband because it was really important to me that I finish this sweater for him. And so I'm glad that that has been done. I can just weave in my ends. I want some amazing yarn chicken. This is the leftovers of the skein that I broke into. I do have a bunch of skeins left, so I need to figure out what to do with those skeins, but I'm glad I didn't need to break into another skein just barely. Perfect, perfect. So this is his Viking cardigan, and oh my gosh, it is so warm. I use Nipix Wool of the Andes Worsted in the color Delft Heather, 
which is why it is so warm. It is 100% wool, it is super cozy, a little bit rustic, not too bad, and my husband really likes it and I'm really excited for it too. I will probably steal his cardigan at one time or other to keep me warm, just to get nice and cozy because it is very oversized for me, but it fits him really, really well. Yay, so, so glad to have finished that. Let me know, have you finished any really long lingering projects recently? I'd love to hear from you down below in the comments. That's my favorite part about this YouTube channel is getting to interact with all of you. So let me know what you've been working on and if you finished any big accomplishments recently. I spent so much time working on my husband's Viking cardigan. I actually only have two works in progress right now and I need to cast on more. I know last podcast I said I would cast on all the things. It hasn't happened yet. Probably because I just feel like with my test knits and my desert bits of dye work socks and this birthday project, I haven't felt like I had the brain space to like cast on a bunch of new things with all the have to do's coming first, if that makes sense. So I'm really hoping I can kind of get on top of things and feel a lot more comfortable to just cast on willy-nilly because I have a lot of skeins ready to go, ready to be cast on. But I'll share with you what I've got works in progress wise right now, and hopefully this will be a shorter podcast than last time. I have a half, I have a half finished object, and this was for a test knit, the Vortex Socks by Kerry Cogan Brown. Ta-da! Look at that beautiful texture. There's an eye partridge heel, which I really need to do more because I really do enjoy the texture. And then it's a little hard in the variegated yarn. You can still see the texture, but you kind of have to look at it at certain angles to see the, um, the spiral. There you go. You can kind of see the spiral of the stitches, which is really neat. Hence the vortex. <sighs> I have not cast on a second sock. And the reason is because I only had to do one sock for the test. And the way that this yarn is dyed, it color pooled in a really bad way so that it was like half the sock was blue and half the sock was pink at the gauge I was knitting. And I did not like that look. So I had to tear back and I ended up alternating two sides of the skein, the inside, the inside pull and the outside pull to try to mitigate that. And it definitely helped. I do still have some color pooling, but it's not nearly as bad as it was previously when I was just knitting straight. Doing this like alternating skeins helped to kind of mix the colors in a little bit more. And so that definitely helped. I didn't need to use both strands of yarn throughout the gusset because it was knit at a different gauge. But then when I finished the gusset, I tried just going with one skein of yarn. It wasn't working so I had to alternate skeins again for the rest of the foot so it was just a little bit more tedious of a project because of that not in a bad way this is like a knit pearl texture which is not necessarily like the most fun for me to do I don't know it just felt very repetitive so I didn't really want to work on it more but I really need to cast on the second sock so I can get working on that but since my pattern test is done Carrie only wanted one sock I only did one sock so I need to get started on the second sock so that it doesn't linger for too long. But I have some other things that are more important to take care of, like my other work in progress. Oh my gosh, except for, let me talk about the yarn. This is Backcountry Knitter in the color Watermelon Soiree. Super, super fun and summery. And then the mini I used was a dragon fruit mini that I got from Backcountry Knitter as well. I thought it would complement really nicely. So that's the yarn I use. That's the nature of hand-dyed yarn. Sometimes you get color pooling and sometimes you need to manage your yarn in order to mitigate that. And it's not as fun to manage your yarn. <laughs> so I've been a little bit lazy and I've not worked on this more, but I hope to get back to it soon. I have another test knit that I actually have to knit both socks for. And so that is my priority project at this moment in time. So this pattern is called the Feather Tail Socks from Hookah Canyon, Kim, I don't remember her last name, but Kim <laughs> from Hookah Canyon. <gasps> Look at this. And if you've read Fourth Wing, you know all about feather tails and you know all about our favorite feather tail, Andarna. <laughs> and this color is not necessarily 
screaming Andarna because it's not gold, 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 but there are like these gold and peachy flecks in this yarn and I love a mint green and it just, I took out all the skeins in my stash that could possibly read as like Andarna inspired, who is basically like a golden puppy dragon. <laughs> so if you haven't read Fourth Wing and this skein was like a last minute addition to that pile of possibilities. And for some reason it was really calling to me. And so I picked it and I'm really happy with it. This golden color really matches the gold of the cover of Fourth Wing that I have. And so I thought it might look really nice in pictures and it's just like, ah. it's just like really fun and pastel-y. This has been such a joy to work up. And this pattern, such a fun lacy detail with some cables on either side. And this, garter stitch heel flap. I've never done anything like that before. And I guess I was nervous that garter stitch stretches a lot more. So I thought it wouldn't work well as a heel flap, but you also slip stitches like you do in a regular slip stitch heel flap. And so it feels nice and sturdy, not too stretched out, nice and thick of a fabric. And so I'm really happy with it so far. I just finished the gusset today. I need to knit both socks in the pair by the end of the test knit, which is later this month. So I need to prioritize this and get a move on, but it shouldn't take too much longer for me to finish this sock, especially cause I'm having a grand old time. This yarn is from me by Haley Bailey from their snail collection. This is called Leptopoma, I think is what the name is, which is a type of snail super cute colors. I had grabbed a random skein because I loved it and I didn't know what to make with it, but I think that this is a great fit for the yarn. So I'm really happy with these and they've been fun to work on. I cannot master cabling without a cable needle. I feel like I maybe I pull up my stitches too much when I'm like moving things around and so if I like hold one stitch in the back while I'm getting the other stitches knit, I like end up pulling that back stitch out from the row before. Anyway, I have a hard time. So if you have any tips for knitting without a cable needle, that would be amazing. Otherwise, what I've been doing is I just use my tapestry needle to like hold my stitches out of the way that I need to for cabling. And then I can like, cause it's only one or two stitches that I need to cable. And so it's been pretty easy to just use my tapestry needle and move that out of the way. And I always carry one in my bag in like a little tin case. And so that's been really convenient for me. That's what I've been doing, but I can't cable without a cable needle at this moment in time. I've not figured it out. Not been dexterous enough to like not drop stitches. So yeah, that's all my works in progress. Not a ton of new projects, unfortunately. I was thinking I would cast on all the things, but I have not. Oh well, <laughs> that's sometimes how it is. Life can get busy and I had other things kind of weighing on my brain. And so I'm really hoping that I can kind of do a reset this next month, maybe start some new projects, do some fun self care and really look forward to what's coming next instead of kind of being stuck in the moment, if that makes sense. I don't know, I feel like I've been stuck in like focusing on all my deadlines rather than just knitting on what I want to when I want to. And I've been listening to myself more in what I enjoy doing. And so I've been doing a lot more reading and other things, working on like gardening type things. So I'll share that too in a later section. But I really am hoping to kind of freshen up and get some new projects on the needles because I just need a change of pace too. <laughs> Should we talk about the whips I haven't worked on? Like my Stephen West sock that has gotten zero love <laughs> since July. And my July socks that have also gotten zero love since like the first week of July. <laughs> Those are my other whips that I have not worked on. Lots of socks. Maybe I should cast on something different. Maybe that's what I need different with my knitting. Not just a new project, but not, not a sock project. I've been doing lots of socks this summer. <laughs> got one yarn package and I got two other yarny goodies. So I'm going to share those with you now. My yarn. Oh my goodness. So excited. I need to actually make a plan for this so I can make this happen. This would be a great winter project. I got some Red Door Fiber Co. Emily Henry yarn because I love Emily Henry and she already announced another book called Funny Story. Yay. So excited. But anyway, 
back to the topic at hand, I got all six colorways from Red Door because I wanted to make a book blanket, like something to cozy up in. So I got Surrey, thinking that I would hold it with like a clean yarn or something so that it would kind of mute the bright colors and kind of soften them up and kind of meld it together, make it more watercolory. So it wasn't so in your face. So the colors would all go together really well and it would still be nice and like warm and cozy with the Surrey. That's kind of my plan, but I don't have an exact idea on what I wanna do for said blanket. Something with squares maybe? Cause I have these six colors plus I have one color from Explore Knits and Fibers who collaborated with Kate on this collection. She did two colors, but she only had the main color in Surrey. I couldn't get the tonal in Surrey, unfortunately. So I'm thinking I might make the six colors that I got from Red Door as like the main colors of the blanket. And then I might use the color from Explore and Some Fibers, which I think is Bee Treed, as like the border maybe, or maybe like joining in between. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know. And I've never made a granny square blanket using Surrey either. So I'm not sure if that is like a possibility or if I should do something different. Who knows? Let me know if you have any ideas. <laughs> but let me show you these colors. And if you didn't know this before, they make the perfect gradient. Ah! Yeah, it makes the perfect fade too. So maybe I should just do a fade for my blanket. I don't know. Anyway, let's start with this one. Happy place, my heart place. I cannot decide if Happy Place or Book Lovers is my favorite. Happy Place made me feel all the things. Book Lovers though is so so fun. I don't know. I don't know. I think if I need to cry Happy Place is the one to go though. Happy Place and then the tonal that goes with it. Do you send all your enemies Bigfoot erotica? <laughs> if you know you know. The next variegated was Book Lovers. Also a love and this tonal, this is my favorite tonal, I think it's called You Make Me Weird. And then People We Meet on Vacation, which may be my least favorite one, though I read it a few years ago. I wanna reread it again this year. Since I read all of Emily Henry's other books this year, I think it'd be good to get a fresh take on People We Meet on Vacation so I can accurately rank it in the list. But this might be my favorite variegated. It just reminds me of cantaloupe. It just looks really yummy. And then this tonal, is called I've Been to So Many Effing Rodeos, which I don't remember that from the book because it's been a few years, so I need to read the book again. But anyway, love them. I am so excited. Maybe I'll do a fade. I'm not sure, but I'll hold it with like stroll or something else like that, more budget-friendly wool yarn so that I can kind of mute these colors a little bit and kind of blend them together a little easier and also make the yard and stretch so I can actually make a blanket that'll probably be like a lap blanket or like a couch throw or something that size so I can cozy on up in it when I'm reading books for my book blanket. It'll be so nice. I'm so excited. This will be a great winter project. I got two other little packages of yarn goodies that I bought. My spending is definitely decreasing as I'm prepping for October and Rhinebeck and Associated Festivals, but this is from Little Owl Designs. I'll show you. So cute for Granny Square Day. Liz released these Granny Square earrings. So cute. They would go with this outfit, I think. And then I also bought this set of stitch markers. There's one big one and two little ones. So cute. I almost bought the like green earrings too, but I like I couldn't decide. I decided on the pink ones. That's what I decided, but so excited. And it's just really fun to see the people that you know online being able to expand their talents and their businesses to be able to do other things that are like really, really cool. So it's been cool to see Liz transition from like designing in a lot of pattern testing to be doing polymer clay stuff. So I definitely recommend you give her a follow. And this other package just came in the mail yesterday. It's so cute. Ah! Oh my goodness. Sorry. I can't help it. But this is a package from Deli Dino World, who if you don't know, makes a lot of food charms and has made like food and like critter fusions. Lots of dinosaur related ones. And I've gotten a couple in the past. They're a little fragile. 
So I've just gone into it knowing that like, I'm spending a lot of money on these charms because they're really, really high quality, but they're also fragile. So having them dangling around on my product when I'm like waving my bag around and like transporting my project everywhere, like they're gonna break. That's the nature of things. And so I would just recommend if you buy something from Deli Dino that you are gentle with it because they're not made to withstand a ton of pressure. <laughs> they're fragile, so be careful with them. And I've accepted that I cannot be careful with them as they deserve. So they will probably end up breaking, but I will love them to death. This was from their most recent update. And I wish I remembered the names, but there is like a Bananasaurus. It's a mint chocolate chip, which is my favorite ice cream. And then this one is like a Stachosaurus, like strawberry taco saurus i don't know it's like a stegosaurus <gasps> but so cute dessert taco love it very desserty they make me hungry for some ice cream anyway these are beautiful like i said they're well made but they are a little bit on the fragile side and i've just come to terms with that and i can't help myself i will love them to death so that's all that i've gotten as far as new yarn goodies go not a ton. So we can move on from this section because I've had for the past couple months, I've had quite a lot come in the mail. I have a couple more things that are going to trickle in here, but really I'm just looking forward to going to New York in October. We are making great time right now on this podcast. I think it's going to be a short one, less than an hour, but we'll see. Now we're going to talk about all things life going on with me. Work has been a little busier than usual, actually. I've had a couple really busy shifts, nothing too crazy and chaotic, but where I haven't been able to do as much like reading and knitting and anything fun, which normally on a day shift, things are busy, but on a night shift, my patients are supposed to be sleeping. So if I don't have a sick patient, then I end up getting quite a bit of time for myself, which is really, really nice, and to interact with my coworkers, which I also like, but I've had a couple sick patients, and so I've been busy helping them out. They're doing better, which is great, and it's really good experience. It's what I want to do in nursing, is take care of patients who are sicker, and so getting that opportunity doesn't come all the time with my unit, but I'm really grateful that I was able to put my nursing skills to the test. So yeah, I haven't had as much time for knitting as well as for like reading as much, though I've done a lot of audiobooks too. And I've gotten into a really good routine of reading at the end of the night before bed. And it's been really good sleep hygiene wise to get me to like fall asleep easier and go to bed at a more reasonable hour. than if I like am on YouTube and knitting at the same time for like a couple hours at the end of the night, I tend to stay up later and I tend to not sleep as well. So it's been good to be reading in bed. I've really enjoyed it. I have done a little bit of, I say gardening, I'm not sure what to call it, but I've got some succulents and I specifically have a string of hearts that was getting way too long and was like dragging on the windowsill. I have it hanging up. I'll definitely show some B-roll. And I snipped a couple of those strands shorter and I tried two different methods of propagation. And one of them, is where you put the pieces in the water and you propagate them that way. And I've not seen any roots, though I haven't seen my string of hearts die, those couple strands in the water. So maybe it just needs a little bit more time. But today I just saw the other method I did, it was called, I think like the butterfly method. So the string of hearts, the way that the leaves are, they come in pairs down the vine. And so you just snip off on either side of that pair so it has the butterfly wings and you put the nub in the middle into dirt and you water it, you keep it more moist than you normally do and they grow. And I just noticed today that some of my plants are growing new little leaves on them. I've seen a couple roots even coming up. So I'm so excited that it's actually working because I was doing it for like maybe a week and a half or two weeks and I haven't seen anything, but they also haven't been dying. So I've just been continuing to water and also like let the moisture out sometimes too and just try to manage them and they're doing good. So I'm really excited. I think I'll probably pop most of them back in my original pot to kind of thicken the growth in my original pot so I can just have more like tendrils coming down, but I probably will have 
excessive amounts of, of little baby strings of heart so I may need to like get another little pot or two to like plant some more to kind of move them into there maybe I'll hang another little pot maybe I'll give something to someone I know I don't really know <laughs> but I'm really excited that those are doing well I'll definitely make sure to include some b-roll so you can see a little bit of what I'm talking about that's probably my pride and joy I have a bear paw that I love also that's growing very very slowly and I have a handful of other plants that are like surviving. They're not doing great. And I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because they're not my favorites. And so subconsciously they're like not getting the love. I just really don't know. So we'll see if I can like help them turn around or if they're just going to live a very mediocre like half dead life for the rest of their existence. I'm not sure. I'm trying to consult with online things and I have a couple books on succulents. I'm trying to learn but I'm also not perfect and I've got a lot more to learn so we'll see kind of how things all shape up but I've really enjoyed having them in my craft room specifically so if you've seen me like looking off to the side I've got one windowsill with all of my plants and my watering implements and I've got one windowsill with my propagations for my string of hearts and so that's like what's going on. They're getting nice sunlight but also nice shade just where my windows are it's been a really good fit i feel like for most of my plants or at least the ones that i care about maybe it's not a good fit for the ones that are struggling a little but they're all succulents so i'm not quite sure i'm still learning <laughs> so let's talk about some books because there really hasn't been a lot going on besides stuff at the house <laughs> and like hobbies and whatnot and just kind of chuggling along so let me share with you the things i've been reading Oh, here's my book stack. And I know in my last podcast, I asked if you wanted to have separate book videos, if I should have a separate book channel, should I rebrand this channel to be books and yarn and other cozy things? Or should I just keep my book content at the end of podcasts? Since I have not gotten feedback yet, I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing. And then maybe next month, because I'm trying to get my podcast on a more monthly schedule, maybe I'll do some like October to be read or TBR video or something like that to kind of maybe it'll work like that that I'll start doing monthly videos at the end of this month we shall see but first book that I finished is called Well Met by Jen DeLuca and this is set at a renaissance festival in a small town but the main character Emily comes to this small town to help out her sister who got in a car accident and she's kind of roped into doing the local run fair that the local school puts on. And she ends up getting to know Simon, who is the director or like one of the main people in putting on this run fair. And she learns more about him. He's very much a grumpy <laughs> character. It was interesting to see his characterization and how he changed throughout the book or how I guess your perception of him changed as you learn more about him. Not my favorite portrayal of Grumpy Sunshine, but not a bad one either. I feel like you did get to know him more and understand him more and he didn't seem quite so gruff. I had a lot of fun with this. I grew up going to Renaissance festivals with my family and so it was just very nostalgic for me and a really comfortable space. It was really fun to have a contemporary romance set in a Renaissance festival with these two people portraying characters in the Ren Fair. And it was really cool to see how their characters interact versus how these people interacted outside the Ren Fair too. And so I really enjoyed it. Four star. Definitely not my favorite in the way that like conflicts were handled and resolved and the ways that the characters communicated and the ways that they resonated with me. Not my favorite, but also not bad either. Like solid four star. I'm hoping I have all the other books in the series because I love this and had so much fun with this. I wanted to read the rest and so I got all the other books. I'm going to hopefully read one more this month before the summer really finishes out. And I'm hoping I enjoyed them just as much, if not more, than this one, depending on, I guess, how I like the characters. We'll see. I really, really liked Emily, the main character, and I liked Simon all right. The next book I finished was The Serpent and the Wings of Night, which I borrowed from a friend. And this book, ooh, it was a doozy. High fantasy, vampires, hunger games, a little bit of political intrigue, a little bit of spice. I really enjoyed it. But man, the last like 80 pages wrecked me. Like so much happens, 
so many twists and turns. You end up like hating people that you thought you wouldn't hate and loving people you thought you wouldn't love. Like it was just like a lot to go through. Like I'm not sure if I'm happy that I had to go through all of that. It made it so I really didn't want to start the next book in the series. It's only a duology, but I really didn't want to start the next book because the way that it ended, just, I had no idea how it was going to work out. And I had no idea what the next 600 page book would even look like. It just like, I did not know. I had too many thoughts and feelings, so many conflicted things going on personally. I just didn't know. And I've started the next book. I have that with me, also borrowed from my friend, The Ashes and the Star Cursed King. And I have read about half of it. I read it on one and a half night shifts that I actually had time on and only half a night shift because things are really busy at around 2.30 and I'm enjoying it. I'm really starting to pick up the pace with this. The first like 100 or 200 pages, I felt like I was trudging through it, but I also think that was like night shift brain. Like I was really struggling to stay awake. Whereas the next 100 pages flew by. I was really engrossed in the story. I really wanted to see how things would turn out. Lots of really interesting concepts. Still very much high fantasy vampires political intrigue, a lot more political intrigue and war going on in this one. Like I said, halfway through the book, still got like 300 pages to go, but I am really liking this, but I think I'll also be happy when this is done. It's just been a lot like mentally and emotionally to take on lots of conflicting feelings <laughs> still about like how I feel about the characters. So yeah, it's been interesting. It's been a lot deeper of a reading experience mentally and emotionally than I anticipated. So I've been enjoying that. Also, I think there'll be some spice, though I haven't got to like the super spicy bit in the second book yet, but I'm sure it's coming. I can just tell. The next book I finished, Payback's A Witch by Lana Harper. Lana Harper? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Anyway, I did an audiobook and I really enjoyed it so much that I bought a copy. And this actually kind of reminds me of Aaron Sterling's books, The X-Hex and The Kiss Curse. And it's pretty similar though I feel like this book it's a witchy romance that feels very similar like set in like the Samhain period of the year and like fall festivals and like there's magical families in town etc it feels very similar but I also felt like it focused a little bit less on the romance like the main plot wasn't the romance the main plot was this competition between different families and Basically everyone gangs up on the one family that always wins every year that's like kind of taking over the town and putting other people's small businesses out of business with all the work that they're doing. And they're basically like steamrolling the town because they've been so lucky. They keep winning this competition and getting more magical powers. Anyway, so everyone gangs up on them, which is really fun to read about. There's also a sapphic romance in here. And I wasn't like 100% behind like these characters in the romance, but I was like for it. What's the best way to describe it? I guess sometimes you're like 100% on board and you're like, yes, these people are meant to be together. Put them together, please. And on the other hand, you're like, I just can't see how these people can fall in love. These characters were like somewhere in the middle, a little bit closer to the, yeah, I'm on board with this, but like I wasn't 100% on board with it. Their personalities were just like really different. So I wasn't like totally behind it, but I was supportive of it, if that makes sense. And a little bit different. I've never read a sapphic romance before. So that was really good to branch out. And I really enjoyed this book enough that I bought some more books in the series, though I read the second book from Bad to Cursed and I did not enjoy that one as much, which is unfortunate because I really, really loved Rowan, who was like the main love interest. He just seemed like my love interest. <laughs> like he just was very like straight cut and like his magic was like animal and plant related. And so that was really vibing with me. I really liked his character. He just seemed like people always told me I was a goody two shoes. I was a teacher pet. Like he seemed like he would vibe with me. <laughs> so I really liked him as a main character. I was not behind the love story in From Bad to Cursed. And I just had a lot of issues with like the plot and like pacing and stuff. I think I rated it like a 3.25, 3.5 star. So not horrible, but in comparison to Payback's Witch, which I think I rated like 4.5 star, it just like fell short for me. And in looking, there's two other books in the series. 
And the third book apparently has some problematic representation of a non-binary character. And apparently the fourth book also is like kind of falling short in, I'm just like, I'm like not sure. I'm kind of regretting that I bought the other books because the second one I didn't like as much. So I don't really want that on my shelf. And I've heard some problematic things about the third and fourth books. So I'm gonna keep reading them on audiobook from my library, but I'm just not sure how they're gonna turn out. Like I may not like them as much, which would be unfortunate, but I think that's something to also recognize and respond to the author if they are not representing people appropriately, if they're missing the mark on what they're doing. The next book I finished was called Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. And this is a retelling from the Greek myth and Ariadne is kind of more of a side character. Really, really cool though, because I really had to stop myself from reading the Wikipedia page about Ariadne because I didn't want to spoil it. But looking at it after reading the book, it actually was pretty true to the original Greek story. And there's of course a couple different versions of how things go, but you know, she's married to the same person. She helped the same, you know, hero, she, you know, family relations were the same. So it was really cool to learn more about that, especially because a lot of the bigger plot points, I was like, oh, I recognize that name. Oh, okay, I've heard of the Minotaur, but like I didn't really know a lot. And so it was really cool to learn more about that. Jennifer Saint's style and her retelling is a lot more tell, don't show. And so it reminded me of other Greek mythology, like the literal mythology that I've read is very much a tell don't show type of style. I've heard that people like Madeline Miller have more lyrical and poetic style that does a lot more show don't tell. And so I'm excited to read some other Greek retellings from other authors to see what style I like the most, but I really enjoyed Ariadne. I think I rated it like a 4.25 star. I feel like the main themes were strong, but also maybe a bit on the nose and there wasn't a ton of depth. There was some depth, but not a ton of depth in those themes and the conclusions and the things that the characters learned. But I did appreciate the main themes of the book and I thought they were very pertinent and meaningful to me as a person, as a woman. It was very feminist, but yeah, so I really enjoyed it. I'm excited to read more from this author and I'm excited to read other Greek retellings from other authors and kind of see what styles I enjoy the most. I read finished <gasps> Shadow and Bone by Lee Bardugo and I really enjoyed this. I read it on my Kindle and I enjoyed it so much I went and bought the book. In fact I bought all the books from the Grishaverse and I'd already read Six of Crows and The Crooked Kingdom and now I want to read them again because this trilogy, the Shadow and Bone trilogy, happens only a couple years before the Six of Crows duology so they're really close in time so like I want to see the connections between them. I really enjoyed, ugh, I hate this shiny cover, but I really enjoyed this book, like a 4.5 star, 4.75, somewhere around there. I really enjoyed it. And I'm excited to read the second book. I basically read the first chapter and then put it down. I haven't come back to it. So I'm not counting that as having started it yet, but I'm really excited to read it. And probably I'll read on my Kindle because it's nice to have a Kindle book for when I'm like on my bike or something. Not like a road bike, but I have a, stationary bike. So having like a Kindle like fits easily in front of my bike and I can read while I'm biking and that keeps me engaged. I really liked it. I'm excited to see where it goes with the series. And I know I mentioned last time I wasn't quite sure why the Darkling needed compassion in the graphic novel I read and I can kind of see it but yet I still kind of like him and I feel like there's he's misunderstood and I don't know. I feel like that belief will be blown out of the water when I read the later books and maybe I'll learn more. But I just like have a hard time believing that he's like 100% evil. That's just me. So I mentioned Erin Sterling. I read The Kiss Curse from her and I had read The X Hex before and I really enjoyed it. I wasn't as much a fan of the concept of the second book. I was like, come on, like the brother is gonna come now to town. Like this just feels like the same as before. It was not. I loved this book. Do I have it with me? I do. I read an audiobook and I loved it so much. I bought it. I love this book. It's about Gwyn Jones, who is the cousin of the other character, and Wells Penhollow, who's the brother of the other love interest. Basically, Wells comes to town 
and Gwen Jones is like a rival shop owner in this town. And so they're like butting heads. So kind of a rivals to lovers type of thing. And then Gwen realizes that her magic is kind of waning and there's this new coven in town. And so things are feeling a little bit like things are gonna go bad. And so then Gwen and Wells try to figure out what's going on and they fall in love. I don't know, I love this book. I don't know what it was about this. I think it was because I wasn't as behind the characters in the last book. I liked them, but I didn't like them a ton. They were all right. But then in this book, I really loved the characters and I loved their interactions. I loved how well they seemed to go together. And I loved the nature of their relationship and like how they explored their feelings. I don't know. I just really, really enjoyed this one, which is good because I enjoyed the first one too. So now I have both. I'm not sure if Aaron Sterling is going to do other books, but it definitely left room for other characters like the baby witches or maybe the third brother in the penhallows and to kind of see where things go with like their dad specifically is going to be doing some stuff I think in the next book. So I'm really looking forward to that. The next book I read probably the lowest rated book of the month. This was The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley and I read The Guest List and I really enjoyed The Guest List by her but The Paris Apartment just kind of fell flat for me. It started off really eerie like the setting it just felt really off and the main character, I can't remember her name, but she was kind of jittery. And so she was kind of adding to the atmosphere of like distrust because like you could feel that something was just like not quite right. Basically the main character is looking for her brother. She asked to come stay with him because she needed to get away from a bad situation. When she comes to his apartment in Paris, he doesn't answer the door and he's not in the apartment when she manages to break in. And so she's trying to find out where he went and you just discover all sorts of secrets in this apartment. And the whole story comes together in a culmination of facts. And so you see things building up. So by the end, there was a twist, but it wasn't a very satisfying twist. And all the other like twists on the way were like, oh, I learned this thing. And it just made all the other details make more sense. So it didn't feel like super crazy and like out there. I don't know. So the twists weren't as satisfying to me. And as I went along, the atmosphere of the book felt less and less concerning. I was kind of hoping for like the feelings to amp up, but I just felt like we were getting more and more answers as the book went along. Well, first of all, the first half of the book, there were like zero answers. It was just like pointless. <laughs> and the second half of the book, you kept getting answers and they were like, they weren't wrong answers. They, they were right answers and you were learning more about what was going on. And so it was more like a mystery than a thriller where you might think you know what's going on and then everything's turned on its head at the very end. That's not what it was. And I kind of guessed who done it. <laughs> I kind of guessed who did it. I had two ideas. They were both right <laughs> in a way. And so it was very interesting. So that was like less satisfying for me. Not a bad book, not a great book in my opinion. <laughs> if you like mysteries and thrillers, you'll probably still enjoy the process of reading this. But for me, it kind of felt like a waste of time. I don't read a ton of thrillers and mysteries. So it felt like it was falling short for what I was expecting from it. The next book I read was Practice Makes Perfect from Sarah Adams. And this is the second book in the When in Rome was like, series I guess. It's like a companion novel so it includes some of the same characters but the focus is on two different characters. It's on Annie Walker who is the younger sister of Noah in the first book and then Will who is the bodyguard or the executive protective agent or whatever it's called of Amelia who's the pop star in the first book and so basically Annie's like the sweet gentle girl and everyone sees her as like this angel Annie and she really hates that moniker and that view of her. She feels like she can't break out and explore things and try new things or make mistakes or swear or like get a tattoo or any of like the fun things she wants to explore like in her young 20s life. She feels really stifled by that image that other people have of her and they don't take her seriously in an adult sense. They see her as this little girl, the angel Annie. And Will, the bodyguard, 
He's just not tied down to any relationship. He's a very sweet guy and very kind. He's a really respectful, that's a great word. He's a really respectful guy, but he's also in zero relationships, has zero commitments. He's just enjoying himself. He does not want to be in a relationship because of his childhood growing up in a broken home. And basically, Annie really wants to learn how to be a better dater so she can end up finding someone to get married to and have a family with. And Will gets roped in to being her like practice person that she can go and practice dates with. And of course they fall in love. And okay, last time I mentioned that I wanted to read this book, but I wasn't sure how it would compare with When in Rome. I love this book more than When in Rome. I just vibed so much with the characters. Annie as a person was really relatable to me and also her desires to kind of break out and try new things and maybe do things a little bit dangerous just really resonate with me and like not necessarily goals I have but like ways in which I want to explore myself and the world around me. It just really resonated with me. I loved Annie and the humor in this was like very plucky, very self-deprecating, and it was just so fun. It made me laugh so many times. It made me feel a lot of things. I just had a lot of fun with reading this, and oh, the romance. It was so good. Oh, I loved it. Not necessarily as much of a slow burn as the first book, but definitely a little bit of a slow burn as they're kind of trying, they're skirting the lines of a relationship, and they're like, trying not to like give in to the feeling that they're feeling and yet their actions don't say the same thing and so it's just kind of confusing to figure out where they stand and so it was really interesting to read about and I really had a fun time. The last book that I finished is called Daughter of the Pirate King by Trisha Levenseller and this book was actually recommended from a local bookstore to me. They were gonna have Trisha come in and do some signings and I did not make it to the signings, but I really wanted to start reading those books. I think the third book may be coming out soon or has already come out. I can't remember, but I read the first book, audiobook. I really enjoyed it. It's like a pirate YA, older YA probably, like a new adult, right? That's like a genre. <laughs> so it's a pirate. This girl is trying to find something, trying to complete a task that her pirate father gave to her on this enemy boat so she's like captured but then she's like breaking out but she's making it look like she was trying to get away when she really just wants to stay on the ship so she's trying to like draw attention away from her true goal I don't know it's just really interesting I really enjoyed the characters and their banter and the motivations that they had and how you started to see their viewpoints of the world were changing her and the love interest so it's really interesting to see there was a little bit of kissing, but nothing too crazy, though it did like mention some spicy topics, but more so like she tried to seduce people to like get what she wanted and then she knocks them out before anything happens so she can like search their body kind of thing. So really fun. The second book I know is already out. I think I already have the audiobook from Libby and so I'm going to be listening to that soon. I really enjoyed it. Oh my gosh, other books I'm reading. I'm, oh man, I'm over an hour. Bummer. I was hoping to get this under an hour, but I have a lot of book things to talk about, I guess. I am currently reading Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. And the first like couple hours felt a little slow. I was like, okay, this is all right. This is like a three and a half star maybe. Like this is interesting. She becomes a war correspondent. Oh my gosh. Immediately the book got so much better when she became a war correspondent. It got so much more interesting. I love this book. I've got like two hours left of listening to it. I cannot put this book down. I am feeling so many things. It's a really interesting mix. It's like a historical fantasy where there are, where there's a small pantheon of gods and there's a couple gods that are warring against each other. And they're in like a World War I-esque type of war. And they're also like writing on typewriters and like columnists for newspapers and then they're like being a war correspondent and there's trenches like so there's lots of things that are very pertinent to like world war one time frame it's set in like 1880 something so it's like a little bit earlier than actual world war one so it's just weird because i'm reading it and i have to remind myself like this isn't actually world war one it's technically a high fantasy because it's a whole different world 
different places. There's gods in it. There's magic. There's like a magical realism, like some buildings are enchanted and some are not kind of thing. And so you kind of get caught off guard by like, oh, this grocery store is enchanted versus like the one down the street is not enchanted kind of thing. Just magic seeping up through the earth and like popping out random places kind of thing and enchanting objects and buildings. It's like really interesting because I keep feeling like it's a World War I book and then I get hit with something fantastical and I remind myself that no, this is a high fantasy that has a lot of elements that mirror World War I era, which is just really interesting to read about. Like it's felt not as high of a fantasy, not as like hard to understand because a lot of elements are things from historical fictions that I recognize. So that's been really interesting. I've never read a book like it before. And The Love, it's an epistolary novel, I think. They're like writing letters back and forth and they're magical typewriters actually like send letters to each other oh my gosh it's so so cute and right now they're like preparing for battle and I'm so so nervous I hope no one dies like I oh my gosh I've been feeling so many things because World War One historical fiction but with like a fantasy and a love interest like it's just like too much for my heart like <laughs> I keep crying and it's just like I can't put it down I love it I'll probably finish it today because I just need to know how it turns out and the second book comes out at the very end of this year around Christmas time I think and so I may just have to pre-order the book and I need to get a physical copy of this book because I'm just loving it so so much it's the perfect blend of like a higher fantasy lots of really interesting things but also it's very relatable and digestible for me because the like super high fantasies are a little bit too much for my brain right now loving that book i'm also reading tress of the emerald sea and my friend's actually doing a book club for this in a week and so i was like oh i need to actually start this i lost track of time so i haven't started it yet but I figured if I read 50 pages a day, I can finish it in time for my friend's book club next week. And I've got about 100 pages in. So I'm right on track and I love this. It's so fun. Okay, first of all, super, super cute. And then there's this like inside art, <sighs> beautiful. And I've heard it likened to the Princess Bride. The narrator is very funny very ironic i laugh out loud multiple times in the chapter and i keep wanting to like take pictures of like quotes because they just like make me laugh and like share them maybe i should share on like my threads or something but it's just super super funny super super interesting and it's just like you thought that it would be like this but let me tell you more <laughs> so it's just really interesting it's a very epic type of novel just hearing about what Tress is going through. So it's really interesting. I really don't know how her journey will go, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. And I'm looking forward to learning more about it. This is Brandon Sanderson's first secret project. He has like four that he did a Kickstarter for. I have the second one too. It's like someone wakes up and it's like medieval Europe, maybe. And then the third book is in the Cosmoverse cosmos or whatever it's called i haven't really read brandon sanderson books this is my first that i plan to finish i started elantris a long time ago and i like can't remember why i didn't finish it i should probably oh i've actually read steelheart which i think is brandon sanderson too anyway i have not read a lot of his stuff and i really want to get into it because he's written a lot and i'm really excited about it and i'm hoping to read through all of his secret project books because they just seem like they're really different than what he typically does and it's really cool to read like the best that an author has to offer but it's also really cool to see like what do they do when they don't have restrictions and they can make whatever they want it just seems like a real expression of themselves and like a way to delve into a different part of the writing so that's really interesting and this is so funny and so interesting and so cute her little romance she's gonna go help her man and I love it it's so cute Anyway, so that's what I've been working on. Again, all these physical books, I've basically been reading at nighttime when I'm trying to stay up for night shifts or right before bedtime. And so I haven't really had a lot of like interruption knitting time other than like my life in general is interrupting my knitting time. I'm hoping to get 
some newer projects on the needles, finish some things that I've got commitment wise so that I can look forward to starting some new things. Maybe my brioche hat, I think that would fly off the needles because it's just, because I just need something a little bit different right now. That's all I've been working on recently. Thank you for joining me as I talk about all things Yarny as well as some books and other life stuff going on. I'd love to hear what's going on in your lives. Share with me down below what projects you're working on as well as any good books that you've read recently that you recommend for me because I love to chat with you down below. That's my favorite part about this YouTube channel is building the community. And at this moment, I have 980 subscribers, so we are almost to 1,000. So if you've not subscribed yet, make sure to subscribe down below so that you can be notified every time I post a new video. You can just go to your subscriptions tab in YouTube and find my latest content. Until next time, happy making. Bye.